really this is more going to be like a kind of a playful experiential activity that we're going to do today and it's a lot about um, I think one of the main reasons I think many of us are here is because of our experiences that's, I, that's certainly why I'm here because uh, how deeply I've been affected in my life um, because of psychedelics I just chose to to really devote a lot of my life to studying psychedelics but at the heart it's really about the experience itself and so we're not going to be talking about neuroscience and we're not going to be talking about phenomenology um, we're just going to be um, I think the goal um, is really um, learning to share skills about navigating our own experience you know so the um, how we can get more skillful how we can get more facility and in an opening to experience uh, that sometimes is challenging but very meaningful so it's this is the area that that Tara and Matt and I are really interested in and so this is Matt Spaulding and uh, so we've all done research in this area and I was had the uh, good fortune to be the chair of uh, Matt's dissertation and also Tara's dissertation, Tara Sammy, and uh, maybe maybe you want to say a couple words about you know your connection to this from your own sure. experience. So I got very interested in. Um, is this working? Yeah. Okay, that's working. Um, I was very interested in the idea of psycho spiritual guidance, of how do we know that we're reliably attuning to truth in our experience. And I interviewed, um, you know, uh, supposed masters from different traditions, Tibetan Buddhism, Jungian psychology, ayahuasca shamanism, um, and also sort of a brand of Sufism. And my basic question was, you know, how do you know when you're on the right track, basically? <laughs> sure. And so my original inquiry was about inner guidance. And the more people talked, the more they said, you know, this sort of distinction between inner and outer is very arbitrary and actually false. And let's look at guidance in general, because outer teachers, outer teachings, traditions, they can serve us in the same way as inner intuitive knowledge can. So I basically used a certain technique called thematic analysis, which Tara used for her dissertation as well, in which you basically get a lot of themes from different people's uh, interview data, and you start to saturate the themes. And after a while, no new themes emerge, and it seemed to be, again, a sense of saturated data where you have, through intersubjective inquiry, a sense of objective truth. And so our real purpose today is to communicate with you our enthusiasm and just, we had so much fun working as a team together for what we're calling collaborative embodied inquiry. And we can see this kind of like inner journey forensics, um, systematic sharing, in which we are all authorities of our own personal experience. And often we hear the word research and we think this is this very imposing kind of like behind the fourth wall process where you need to either have a white lab coat or a series of PhDs, that kind of thing. And we want to really help to democratize and demystify this process of qualitative research. And again, we're calling this collaborative embodied inquiry. Better? Yes. <laughs> okay, so in a moment we're going to model for you an exercise that then we want you to engage in. So I want to say a word about um, what we mean when we talk about contracted and ex uh, contraction and expansion in the body. So my research, I was interested in expressive, spontaneous movement as it arises in the psychedelic journey. Um, so you, you all know that you can, you can see and feel, you know, in the posturing of the body and the moving body, expansion and contraction, right? The contraction being those familiar, you know, restrictive patterns of movement in the body, rigidity, you know, the dissociated self that's often associated with fear. And then the expanded self being more expressive and creative and playful and... Um, you know, the clarity of mind and that integrated sense of self, um, you know, where everything is moving in synchrony and harmony and that vision that you're moving towards is, you know, your whole body is engaged in it. So, um, 
I invite you to think about, you know, the embodied experience or the experience of your body, all the sensations, saturate your sensations into um, the experience that you choose to share with us, which Frank will now describe. So the slide we have up here right now, it's just I was trying to pick a slide, like what could be an image that could talk about this, uh, this state, the shift we make, you know, from a relatively contracted place that we might find ourselves in and then what it might feel like to move from that place to, to a relative sense of expansion. And this slide is an alchemical slide. Probably a lot of people have seen this slide. And, and, uh, but basically, there's two realms here, you know, divided like a veil. There's a veil between these two realms. And the one realm, I'd like you to imagine, represents maybe kind of normal consciousness, you know, where there is a, some sense of contraction. Like right now, I have a, a slight pressure in my chest, you know, talking in front of you guys. So it's a, you know, if I notice it, I think, oh, okay, that's there, right? Ah, yeah. So this, this experience is a little bit out of awareness most of the time. But when we take psychedelics, I think it's shown to us, you know, uh, our bodily state. So this talk is about our bodily experience, like as a foundation for our visions. So sometimes we're in this one side of the veil, and sometimes we're released into this other side, and we're, we find a, a much larger part of ourselves. So this inquiry we want to do today is really just experiencing each, each of us, checking in, noticing examples in ourselves of this contracted experience, what that notice like, from memory, you know, or from right now. And then also, when we, we probably can remember times when we've relaxed and things have happened and we felt expansion. What was that like? How did that feel in our bodies? So that's what we're going to be doing today. And we're going to first model that for you. You know, we're going to do an, an exercise in front of the group here in these three chairs. And if you can't see in the back, maybe you can stand up or just come closer. We're just going to model an activity that we've created. Um, and it's in the handout. All the directions that we're talking about are, are in the handout. So we're going to um, we're going to sort of. Uh, is there anything else I should say, Mary? The Goldilocks principle. Oh yeah. oh yeah, yeah, yeah. In the handout, you'll see. I was trying to think. Well, what type of an experience is good to to recall from memory? I mean, memory is kind of amazing because. Memory is really a bringing back into consciousness of something we lived through before, and if it's unfinished, it's going to have some energy. Let's say it's meaningful, but there's still, we know there's more there for us. There's more to be known. It's a kind of an open, it's something we know we're working on. And that's the type of memory I'd like you to bring into consciousness. Something you've touched upon, that's been meaningful to you, um, but it's maybe a little challenging because you haven't quite unpacked it yet, right? There's still something there for you. But how strong should it be? And I'm suggesting the Goldilocks, you know, kind of story is good because Goldilocks, you know, she was trying to figure out, like, you know, what type of, what was the right bed for her, you know, to, to, to be in and what, how hot the porridge should be. And so this Goldilocks principle uh, applies to this exercise. It's like, if you just get something that's right in between too strong and too weak, moderate intensity is, is the best type of experience to, to, to explore this skill. So uh, it shouldn't be too hot, it sh like Goldilocks, shouldn't be too hot, shouldn't be too cold, just right for you. And if you can try to think of an experience like that, it it's probably will work the best. So, um, is this, should we do a little modeling, do you think? Okay. We might be doing some collaborative microphone sharing, too. Um, this one is working. So, let me mention an idea we have. I mean, we've never done this, really, before with anywhere near a group this size, so this is really experimental for us, and what we're doing, we're lining the chairs up in, in, in a line here. So, we're thinking, you know, you two can do this, three people in a line, okay? Um, also, um, 
if the chairs are closer together, you can hear each other better. With a big room, a lot of people talking, it's gonna be hard to hear. So if you, I think we should move our chairs together here, make them closer. And in the center chair, it would be good to have the person who's, we're called the sharer, the person that's really sharing their experience. And uh, this is sort of like the triad that we've thought about. And we have used this triad before. There's somebody who's sharing their experience. There's somebody who's asking the questions that are on the handout. And there's somebody who's witnessing and maybe actually taking a few notes. And so we view this as a kind of qualitative research. But the thing that's different is that it's, you're gonna hear our experience, but you're gonna hear other people's experience. And later, when we actually have people report their experiences, we're all gonna get a sense of the range of experiences that people have. So this is the social part of, of you know, have ever you noticed that when you talked about a psychedelic experience, it was hard to describe because, because it's so personal. We're, we're trying to build language, new language to talk about the subtle. Okay, so we, we look at this as a language process. And that's why I think it's good to do it in public. Because in public, it's where language is created. Okay? That's, 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 our, that's our idea. Okay, so for this demonstration, I'm going to be the sharer, and Tara is the witness, and Frank is the researcher. Okay. And you're going to be prompting me with a question, is that right? You're right. And I'm going to choose an experience in that sort of Goldilocks middle area, which is kind of a threshold experience, and I'm going to sort of focus on uh, an ayahuasca experience, so that we're in the context of a psychedelic inquiry. And I'm sort of just going to do this real time. But sort of I'm going to first just bring up to mind a memory of when I so, felt. So really, Matt should be quiet at this stage. Okay. Because I'm the researcher. Thank you. And the researcher says, <laughs> just what Matt was saying, <laughs> uh, I want you to really recall from memory an experience that's meaningful and challenging. And an experience that feels just right to you, not too intense, not too mild, so it's not really there, but still alive, still present in your awareness, that it has a life of its own. It still has, it has a, an energy and a life. And, and let me know when you, when you locate an experience like that. Okay. Do you have, do you have something? I do. Okay. okay, I'm just reading from the script here. Okay, can you first think of this and then bring it into memory? It, you know, uh, it's just moderately difficult, contracted experience. So first I want to work from the side where we're, it's relatively contracted. Um, now, I want to, I'm going to ask you first about the contracted experience, and I'd like you to give me embodied language. You know, like how does your body feel in this space where it's relatively contracted? What, what type of words come to mind? So I'm in this memory and um, I'm feeling this almost like, thank you, like I'm in a, like I'm in some sort of chasm or gully and I'm feeling a bit pinched on the sides and a, a bit of, a bit of constriction in my chest in the sort of solar plexus area and there's a, a red kind of pulsing vibration there as well and a tightening. I notice my breath is getting a little shallower, and I'm just sort of trying to stay with this and see if there's any movement to it. And there's greens and browns, and, and I feel like I'm being squeezed. Squeezed through some sort of, uh, like a canal. Of, and as I say that and stay with the experience, I. Uh, I find my breath naturally going into my belly a bit more. There's a feeling of blue, uh, almost a blue, a luminous, uh, more space as my mind or my awareness goes into my belly center. And the belly is now calling my attention more and more. And I sort of feel like I've kind of come out into this, um, into this sort of pool like a more spacious expanse, and I feel like I'm in water now. 
more sort of buoyant. It's un very unusual for anybody to go so fast from contraction to expansion, so he, he's shifting really fast. Typically, in my experience, in my own experience, it could, I could be 40 minutes just, you know, noticing, noticing what it feels like when there's something there that I can't work with yet, right? Uh, so just to normalize this experience for everybody, I think that's more typical where you're just going to really, it may not open in 40 minutes, right? It's more like, so maybe another way to work with this is, is as, you t as you feel into this, feel into the contraction, and then you can remember a different experience perhaps where you felt expansion. So not always is an experience that's contracted going to open so quickly into expansion. It's quite rare really. So, but we all can recall from memory an experience that, that opened for us, where we felt that flow, something let go. And we just, so I'm gonna let Matt continue now about the, the flow process. Um, I sort of feel like actually had that description of being in that pool was, was in that space. Yeah. Maybe we can turn it over to our witness a bit of what that was like to observe that process. So, this. Hello? Yeah, that works, okay. Um, so, just noticing at first he started with his eyes closed and I, his body was very stiff, the way he was holding it, as Frank was asking this question. Um, and then you started by bringing your hand to your chest and your whole body started to collapse and shake and your voice started to shake. Um, and then some of the words that were really sort of salient and evocative, a red pulsing vibration, a tightening. Um, you noticed your breath was shallow. I noticed like a, a breathlessness and um, there were fewer words at this point and then you started talking about trying to stay with the experience. Um, and your hand moved down from your chest to your belly. And then the, the colors shifted. You had talked about greens and browns, and now you were talking about blues and space and spaciousness and expansive and water. And then you were interrupted. <laughs> <laughs> just for me right now, hearing that feedback, um, it just feels very validating of an experience that still felt kind of amorphous. So that's sort of helping me with the scaffolding of, of kind of making meaning of that seemingly inchoate kind of shift. Mm -hmm. So thank you. We can, I think we can stand up now. Um, so we, we wanted to model this for you to give you just a feel for how you might want to if you want to, it's very optional. Like, people don't need to leave the room if you don't want to take part in this activity. <laughs> you can stay and just watch. It's not like, I, I, hate it. I hate it when you have to stay put and do some experiential thing. I, I want to run for the door myself. So you don't have to run for the door. You can just watch. I mean, being a witness is fine. You can just watch this. You don't need to participate. But some people want to participate. So if you'd like to participate, you know, find three people and, and get in a row like this and the person that wants to share first, get in the center, and we'll sort of talk you through it, and we're gonna walk around the room, and if you have a question as it's happening, just put your hand up, and we'll come by and do a little kind of consultation. <laughs> so, uh, are you guys up for this? Do you wanna give this a try? Sure. Okay, good, so a little bit of a pause now for a little bit of rearrangement and crosstalk, and then we'll start up again in a couple minutes. Yeah. We're done down here, yeah. 
I gotta remember to like, I keep getting to like bring humor in. Okay. I, know. I guess people are, that are up for this are in position, getting ready to begin. So, what I suggest is um, the person who's the sharer should be, you know, either in the center or wherever you need to be so both people can um, uh, be close to you. And I think you can just begin in your own time, you know, reading from the script in the role of the researcher, whichever one of you is the researcher. The witness can take notes. And we'll, keep, we'll do timing for you. We'll keep time. So my hunch is let's do maybe five minutes or a little bit more to begin with. And if you have a question about anything, just put your hand up and we'll come right over and, and chat a little bit. Okay? So I think you can begin. So we can walk around and take a look for a hand. Oh. Oh, yeah. Can I borrow one of these? You just need. Does anybody else need instructions that doesn't have them, or who didn't get the handout? Do you guys have more than one handout? Could I have one handout if you get to have one? Okay. Do you have more than one hand up? I know. Okay. You just need one hand out. Sure. Yeah. Also, feel free about adapting this to your own purpose. And for those of you that don't remember the question or don't have a handout, just recall from memory a meaningful and challenging experience that's moderately intense for you. And have your focus mainly on the body. This is right now. This is just. I'd like you to continue for another three minutes, and then we're going to have you report your experience up, just in key words, okay?
we're just going to contract the first time. Okay, why don't we call a pause right now in your process. Obviously, it's not finished. In, this is just a kind of a brief taste and a demonstration of, a, of an activity. But we just wanted to give you a taste of it. And now the second part of the activity is the social part because we want to collect your words that from, from anyone and just bring them together and, s and let's all see them. What kind of words do we have? And so anybody who would like to share a little bit of what your experience was, the kind of words that came to you as you described your experience, that would be great. So is there any? OK, yeah. Yeah, they could be from the note taker. So let me review some of the words here. Review the words here. At the, uh, the first question, with the first question, with the first question, there was uh, anxiety, tightness in the chest, almost a subtle shakiness, a subtle shakiness. Yeah. Do you just want individual words? Okay. Um, shakiness, fear. And um, the fight or flight. He didn't. Those are my words. He yeah. said he wanted to run away. Um, continual expansion. As continual expansion. So we're just picking right now. We're just working with the contracted phase. Okay, and we'll come back and get more. So let's hear a little bit more about the the the, ver the variety of experience. Okay, that's fine. It doesn't entirely work for me, but um, let's see. Um, okay, okay. Yeah, I'd like to interact a little bit more closely with people. Is there another group that would like to, or an individual would like to share a little bit about what, what okay, go ahead. Um, there were, well, out of the night, two points of pressure. Um, one felt as if it was being pulled inward into my chest and uh, another one in a different part of the chest slightly lower pushing outward. Um, Got a lot of chest exper experiences around the chest, right? And some pressure in? And some pressure in and some pressure out. So pressure in and, and out. Okay. Eventually a movement from the chest to a outward pressure in the throat. Okay. But all of them felt um, uncomfortable, tight, okay. um, almost like a, a squeezing. Constriction? Constriction. Yeah. Constriction, squeezing. Anybody? Uh, other? Other? Yes, yes. I like running around. That's why it makes it more fun. What was your experience? I, I'm noticing, looking back over these pa these words, that everything involves muscular tension. The eyebrows are coming together. The the uh, fist is clenched. The knees are together. I you know holding the breath. So it all involves muscular holding. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so a kind of defensive holding in posture. Yeah. Yes. Uh, okay. So. First, I noticed he was uh, anxious and kind of shifting around. Um, body gets heavy, feels lightheaded. His his ears are blocked. Um, he also reported uh, a tingling sensation, uh, similar to losing contact. And um, he referenced it was a little like um, uh, getting carsick. What I what I like to hear here is the variation. Now we have a slightly something slightly different, right? Nausea. Because uh, I know Tara, Tara and I did a little work yesterday, and I think your thing is nausea, Tara. Why don't you talk a little about nausea? <laughs> no. <laughs> <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> but but it's quite different. It's quite different, right? To feel a muscular contraction pattern, 
versus the nausea pattern. It's a, it's a slightly different thing. So I think, it's, I think that's why it's good for us to talk among ourselves to see the variability of how we could, each of us in our own way is having, we're, we're feeling the contraction, but how we feel it is different, right? And so my sense is what we might see might be different too, right? So this, even though it's the similarities, there's differences. And what I think if we share more in a community, we'll understand our type, you know, how we, where we go, where we go with contraction, right? So that's, that's the purpose of, of this. Yes. Um, just one more, I guess, component to the contraction part, uh, a feeling of dissociation um, and constriction, which is already up there. Are there other, other, maybe something different yet and we haven't heard? Yeah, we had the tightness in abdomen as well. Because there's a lot mentioned about chest but not uh, the abdomen. Did anybody here have a chance to, for the experience to move into the expansion part where, we, where you felt relief, freed from that? So maybe we shift a little bit now to, to the other side of the, chart up here like when when things release and when they move what is that what is that feeling so I felt I felt like I was being held the holding yes um, it was a uh, uh, it's always a very loving feeling holding in love so here's a this comes in a lot for for many people, and for me it does. This is one of my patterns. So holding and love. How about for other people? When <laughs> yeah, sure. Ha, uh, how's we, how are we for time, Tara? Okay. Uh, also, we're going to encourage, we want to have this ongoing. We, we're, this is not just one shot deal for us and what we would like. We would like to continue with this activity and um, we would like to have it to be a community activity, and we recommend people do this with their friends and play with it yourself. And, you know, we're not, we, didn't, we don't own it, you know. It's like yours now. <laughs> you can play with it. It's pretty simple. You just, you know, you just, you know, it's just talking and experiencing. And so this is like a brief introduction, okay? So we can't do it fully, completely for all three of you, but I, I'm saying just you, you can take it away and use it. And if you want to communicate with us, you can. And we love to have your interactions to help us refine this. Because we can't refine it by ourselves. We need many, many voices and many experiences to refine this. So we'd be happy to e email with you and continue this. Okay? Yes? With uh, techniques like neuroemotional technique and probably dozens and dozens of others where you're doing pressure points and have you have any thoughts about integrating things like that into this to help embody it, release it, tie it to the neurology, make it more powerful? Yeah, yeah, we're at the very beginning of, of this. The part that we like the best is, is everybody able to hear other people's uh, experience in, in one big room. We like the idea that we can hear, oh, that person's sort of like me, but that person over there is not like me. And I really, so we learn where we fit in our social world, you know. I'm not like everybody, but I'm similar to some people, right? So I think that helps us build a social world about our experience. So that's the main thing that we think is innovative about what we're doing. Other than everything else, somebody else has done. The only part that's innovative is hearing it in public, in a public space. You know, that part I think is unusual. I have never heard it myself. So that's, that's, what we're in. So we, that's why we call it collaborative, collaborative embodied inquiry. You know, so we're, we're collaborating. It requires collaboration, but I think any, but collaboration means you adding what you think you'd like to contribute. So we're, we want to have it develop and, and add things for sure. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. Any other thoughts about the expansion, the, the, the part of expansion? Yeah. I, I'd like to go back to the beginning as to why this is an important thing to do. So this is about accessing something in our lives or on a, on a psychedelic journey that we might have been in that was uncomfortable and that we wanted to release. Is that correct? Do I have that right? Yeah, it's, you know, in my own experience, you know, 
what I learned is if I paid attention when I went back and forth between contraction and expansion, because I've done a lot of psychedelic journeys, and typically I get jammed up at certain places, and then I get expanded, I've been paying a lot of attention. What does it feel like going back and forth? Because I think if I, we learn more about the landscape of going back and forth, then the next time we'll know more. So it's really developing a skill of, of awareness of the contraction, awareness of the expansion, and then it's like we know the landscape, we know the way. You know, so I just think awareness will help us, a navigation skill. I look at this as a navigation skill. The, so, and it's easier to do it in the normal state because you can practice on a memory, right? That I think we can then use in a journey. That's, that's the idea. Well, actually, I came in late. I'm so sorry. So, you know, but I'm just like, wow, <laughs> where have I been? I'm so sorry. I well, it is very emotional. The reason we pick the body is because everybody has a body, and the body energies, I think, in my, I don't know, maybe I'm wrong, but our body energies are more similar. We have a, you know, we have a body, but then by the time it gets to emotions and visions, it could get very, very dissimilar. So I'm thinking, in many ways, the hard parts are body energies that are really jammed up anyhow. So I'm, that's why I'm focusing more on the body, because I think the body is what gets contracted, you know. And so that's why I've been emphasizing the language of embodiment, you know, for this process. But you could talk about emotions, you could talk about visions, but we're focusing right now on bodily experiencing, okay? That's why we had that focus. Um, any other uh, experiences of the expansion? Uh, okay, so we didn't go too far into the expanded experience, but uh, he mentioned in his experience that he uh, exited a cave, looked up at the stars, and was uh, breathing the fresh air. So, the, so a cave, first a cave, exiting the cave, stars, fresh air. So isn't it fascinating, the image reflects a a small space and then a big space, right? So this is what I think the, this is what I am always amazed by is the body's feeling goes along with the vision to some extent, right? The body is, there's a tightness around the body and then the cave, right? <laughs> and then coming out of the cave and then the expansion. So I really think, you know, all the levels of us are talking to us during journeys, right? At the same time. So that's an interpretation, though. This is an interpretation. Um, but I think the words cave, you know, you, so much about caves and dark places and the underworld, and then also, you know, the exp what was your, the expansion? What was like a, a, like, a uh, like stars? It was like seeing a, a big starry sky? Yeah. First there was a lot of smoke in the cave, and I had to lie down. It was really... Suffocating. <laughs> Suffocating in the cave, lying down. <laughs> right. And I, I just couldn't get the idea of just getting out, leaving the place. Didn't came to me. Finally, finally it did. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Good. Good. So, um, so where do we go from here? How, what do you think, Tara? So at this stage. We haven't been able to do this completely, of course, but let's say we did this with everyone in the room and had time to do that, and we had all that information up here. Then what we would do, we would look at all these words, and we would see patterns. We would look for patterns. What patterns? And, and we wouldn't think in advance what it's going to mean, but we would just see what patterns are there. You know? So that's, to me, that's the kind of approach is I don't want to figure it out. I'd like to see patterns emerge spontaneously from many, many comments from many people. And I'd also like to learn for myself my style, my style of expanding, how I expand, right? And then if I know my style of expanding, and I also know my style of contracting, maybe that can guide me the next time I have an experience. So that's the hope that, that we could develop this. I just want to add, I, um, in you know, qualitative research method, you would, you would just have the researcher and the participant, and you would do 
in-depth interviews, and then you have um, you, you transcribe them, and then you're able to go back and read um, closely and pull these words out. But what I was excited about that we're doing here is the witness is present. So it's like having having you know video data in real time, and not only having the salient words and what's evocative in the words, but being able to read the body and and feel the feeling tones and hear the voice the tone of the voice so i wanted to see you know what you know i'm very curious how people are able to shift from contracted states to expanded states i want to learn from all of you and i think we can learn a lot from each other about that so here we were able to have the witness in the moment observing and that's different from anything i've experienced um, you know as as a qualitative researcher so yeah. Well, I just for me, what's always interesting is when we increase the nuance of conversation, and so we're sharing, you know, very private, right, experiences in real time. There's this real time data, and it's both normalizing when we hear other people having similar experiences, but also realizing how unique ours is. And the more we articulate, especially from a place of, you know, being kind of like thickening community, right, having these private experiences be more and more of a public um, sharing the more the nuance and the subtlety, I think, of our language and therefore our next experience gets as well. So like Frank said, this is really helpful in terms of real-time navigation. So we've done this in a pretty contrived setting here, but in a psychedelic context, right, where these kind of experiences can be much more charged and extreme, we can maybe even sort of part of us has rehearsed this subtle navigation and creating meaning through articulation as well. And I, I think a lot of times we think that we need a shaman to guide us. You know, we need a, someone to tell us what to do. And I think, I'm for democracy, I'm thinking maybe we could, through a democratic process, by sharing our experiences openly with each other and seeing what we share together, that, that this could be more sort of a, a method that, that, that we, we learn things together rather than having this hierarchical arrangement where people tell us what, they, pe what things mean for us. So I, I have more belief in this sh sharing of experience. This is, I mean, I've been in many hierarchical situations with shaman. I think you can learn many amazing things, but I think we also can learn a lot from each other. So it's kind of a peer learning process, for sure. So maybe we should just have questions now, because we have some time between now and when we end at 3.30. So are there any questions? Do people have questions? Uh, yes, I have a question about how you feel, um, you know, language shapes thought, sh shapes our experience a great deal, and Wittgenstein, and Wittgenstein, and Cyril, et cetera. And, um, and certainly in a, a consensus reality sense, which is most of where we operate and most of our time. How do we get out of that trap? I like that trap. I love, I love language. He, the question was, how do we get out of the trap of language? I don't think we want to get out of the trap of language. We experience directly, and then it's natural that we're going to talk about it with our friends and, you know, and share. So I just think these are two activities, the direct experience and the sharing. But we know we interpret a dream. Like we have a dream. It's a direct experience of a dream. Then we want to understand it. So we think about it, and we, talk, we tell somebody, our friend, about a great dream we had, and they help us make meaning of it. So... The making meaning process is a collective process. We can try to do it ourselves, but we tell a dream. We hope someone can help, you know, who knows us. Like I always notice when I have a dream, if it's really intense, sometimes I can't see it. I'm, my ego is too invested. But my good friend can tell me, you don't understand that dream? It's obvious. <laughs> you know? it's so, so the sharing, this, this sharing is, is very productive when the other person knows you well. Uh, I want to pick up another question before I get to your follow-up question. So are there, are there other questions? Maybe about language or about other things? I'm, I'm curious about, uh, in the work you're doing in this collaborative sort of environment, uh, if you have some uh, loose suppositions of what might be going on, whether it's microneurons firing commonly or whatever. Wow. You know, I am trained as a neuroscientist, but it's almost like I don't care anymore. 
I mean, I sort of do care, but you know, life is short, and how many questions can you answer? And this is a better, I, for me, this is a better question because it's the heart of the matter, my direct experience, my life, the meaning of other people's lives. I think the neuroscience stuff is great, but when it comes, like, really when it comes down to something practical that you can use in your life, I've decided to go this direction. You know, I'm glad the other people are doing the neuroscience stuff. I might do some future neuroscience studies. I really feel the direction is the subjectivity. I think the direction of progress we're going to make as a community is subjectivity. Hi. I'd like to hear from the other two presenters about this process. One thing that comes up for me from what Frank was just saying is what we're doing here, we're also doing systematic sharing. So it's one thing just to have casual conversations, right? But we're creating just a tight enough and just a loose enough, again, that Goldilocks kind of principle with the structure itself of how we have some kind of context, right, to continue sharing information where we can build upon each other's experiences, right? So in my dissertation work, you know, these different people, I had the same prompting questions, but because these people were coming from very different cultural backgrounds and very different sort of spiritual lineages, they were speaking in very different languages in response. But through this process, I could start to see these patterns emerge that otherwise would have seemed very kind of chaotic or fragmented. And after a while, by kind of seeing the patterns emerge, I could kind of distill them into certain categories of experience. And the feedback between seeing those categories and my own evolving experience, I was able to have, I think, to save a lot of time in terms of recognizing patterns, patterning of my own internal dynamics as a result of sort of that comparison process. So it's just been really helpful for me to sort of see, again, the sense of these shared dynamics that can be experienced also in very different ways. So it's liberating and at the same time normalizing. I'm curious, I didn't quite catch the question, I'm sorry, about language. Can you repeat the question? Right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I personally feel very trapped by language and words, and I wish I didn't. Um, so I get Frank's point about, you know, I mean, you know, it's like, tough shit, little girl, you live in a verbal world. Like, I have to deal with it, and it bothers me. Um, that's why <laughs> I love dance, um, and that's where, you know, I, I discovered this method of research um, inquiry, not because, you know, it started from I'm, you know, really excited about qualitative research. It's because I was really excited to um, explore my own experience of movement, and in particular in the in the psychedelic journey, it's really, I think, what saved me many times. It literally helped me move through some very difficult experiences that I think I couldn't have done personally uh, with words or sitting and working through the blocks. I it was, you know, some very difficult experiences that I think got harder when I took myself out of what I later came to realize was the sacred context for me, and it was where dance was involved. So the language can be a language of the body. It doesn't have to be language of words. It can be, it can be anything that expresses words, shapes, colors, gestures. So language conceived of as expression that can be show the ineffable. Expressive forms that can show the ineffable is really what we're talking about. Um, so we're going to... Can I just add one more thing, Frank? Yeah, go right ahead. I think what we noticed here in the person who oh, wanted to... Oh, we can't go... Yeah. We have to, oh, 10 minutes, oh, okay. Good. Thank For example, the person who wanted to continue, right, with this exercise, I find with myself, when I'm solitary, I often don't have the patience or let's say the curiosity to really continue an inquiry as in, to the same degree of depth as I do when I'm sitting with somebody else. So the sheer act of kind of having this be a shared experience, for me, makes it a lot more fun 
makes it a lot more kind of that co-curiosity. Um, I can kind of sink in deeper for a longer period of time without it feeling like a chore. And that's something about the collaborative context I think is really magical, too. We, we've learned that the triad may be better than the dyad. The, the dyad can easily, not degenerate, but morph into just chit-chat. The triad is a little bit of an unusual situation with one person just watching the nonverbal and then uh, uh, another process going on. So it actually holds the frame a little bit better for this activity, for it to be systematic. And then you can always just have, you know, just laugh and joke. But holding the frame of the triad seems to be useful over the dyad. So we discovered that. Um, I was thinking that this triad might work as well for the visual piece. I'm not an artist. And I would love to be able to draw what I see. And you know, when we go and see the visionary art, it speaks to us, but it doesn't speak to our specific vision. Yes. And I, I love this idea, and maybe have one of the people in the triad be an artist that can quickly sketch what you're describing. Wow. Um, anyway, that, that was That's what very just hit me. <laughs> I'm curious about the movement between the contracted and the expanded states. And for you, when you think about being able to track one or the other and the movement between them, is it with the intention of catching oneself when going from expanded con to contraction to prevent that? Or is it more sort of about letting go of volition and tracking it without trying to control that sort of movement? I'm curious. That's a, that's a really good question. I've tried all the above. <laughs> you know try to figure out which is better or which is useful or when is it good to let go, when is it good to try to control, when is it good to sort of not have any intention at all. And I think they all lead to different results. Um, but I think when you can just purely observe with no intention to go anywhere in particular and just be like as if you're like going to just have to report back all the details, sometimes it facilitates the process having no goal but just to only to, to just look at sheerly the nuances of, of the subtleties of the process of the change. You know, I think sometimes if we have a motivation, it kind of clouds what we can see. So if there's almost no motivation to have anything different happen, we can just look very clearly at the transition as it occurs. That's been my experience. Yeah. And also, we only pick one thing, contraction, Relative contraction to relative expansion. We picked that because it's a kind of a universal that we all have. But you could do this inquiry around any psychedelic experience. You could do it from the idea of when before the entity, before the entity encounters comes into your field, what was going on before the entity occurs, the entity appears. You know, any transitional phenomena you could, you could look at it in this way. Right? This is just one thing we picked, contraction to expansion. Right? But any phenomena, you could apply the same. It's just simply the approach is the border between two things, examining the border space between two occurrences, before the occurrence and after the occurrence, and, and looking very closely at what, what is happening. So it's applicable to any border phenomena, right? When there's a transition from one state to another. Does that make sense? What's another example for that? Oh, yeah. Uh, in in uh, transitioning from a contracted to an expansive space, mm -hmm. uh, what kind of movement is ideal to move from one space to another and to uh, remember that within the body? Great question. I have the same one, and that's why I wanted to study movement in the psychedelic experience because I believe in the you know the wisdom of these medicines to to teach us. I mean, and so touching on your question, you kind of have to surrender to the experience. So, but it's helpful to have some, you know, you, you can pick up these, these little pearls of wisdom as we do throughout life. Oh, what do I do when I'm, you know, the energy's all up here and I'm anxious and how do I bring it down? So through, you know, through these journeys, there's a lot we can learn. And then maybe, maybe there are certain shapes and forms to the movement, which 
um, I, did, I did touch upon in my dissertation research and would love to talk to you or anyone about more. But you know, wh how does this, the body spontaneously move? in order to heal itself? Are there archetypal movements? You know, so these are all really interesting things to think about, and I think we can learn a lot through the psychedelic journey. Like, what is what is our, our body, um, you know, spontaneously pulled to do in those moments? Thank you, that's helpful. That's a great question, and I think the underlying theme that all of us are working upon, I think, is spontaneity. We really believe that all these transitions there is a spontaneous way to make the transition. It's just, can we find it? Can we allow it? Can we surrender to it? But sometimes when we're frightened, we, we, we can't find it. So our assumption is we don't have to create a way to go. We just have to find the spontaneous pattern that's already there. I think one thing we all you know, take for granted is that the body, um, when we just stay with the process and trust the process of our unfolding experience, there's an intelligence. There's an innate sense of increasing coherence, increasing complexity often, right? But that it's not a chaotic, this sort of whatever comes up to consciousness tends to really appreciate um, sustained contact. And something new seems, at least in my experience, seems always to emerge. So there always seems to be some sense of, some kind of evolution of, um, of clarity. Yes. Uh, is it possible to translate the word contraction to no and the other um, expansion to uh, inner yes? Um, for me, uh, the word contraction and all the words we write down is like a, an inner no. No, I don't want, no. And the expansion is an inner yes. Actually, that's a very, simp very succinct way to put it. <laughs> yeah, I like that. For me, it, it makes sense for me. And that's the other thing is it makes sense for me, but it maybe not doesn't make sense for you. So we, it's sort of a collective thing. We, we find where we agree, and, but there's sort of no one answer. You know, in some sense, there's no one answer. But for a group, maybe for those, like my, I'm very heart oriented in the sense of my heart contracts and I feel it in my heart and when I open, I open through the heart. But other people, it's not like that, that they have another pattern. But for people like me who have this particular pattern, I bet we can develop a very clear language. So I think there's a set of languages maybe that we're, that we're f gonna find, and, but, they're, but they're not just one language. There's, you know, some people, the doorway is the heart. Some people, the doorway is the third eye. You know, so I, I think there are different doorways, and we sort of figure out where our doorway is, and we talk to the people that are like us, and I think like that, you know, but I don't think the one answer. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So I had a bit of a question and comment. Um, regarding the... Uh, sort of linguistic recording aspect of uh, the trip, um, or the experience, I guess. Um, what is the, so some people, I guess, have a preference towards writing things in words, and that's what we've been going through, and other people have preferences towards uh, visual images and drawing, and other people might have preferences towards auditory experiences. Um, what are your guys' feelings towards uh, recording, like through video cameras or um, you know, uh, sound and audio? Because um, I, I could see that working in some ways, being able to record, for instance, uh, physical motions, dance, for instance. But then it also really doesn't catch, I think, some of the uh, physicality of actually experiencing dance or motion. No, I, I think we ought to be really kind of creative and imaginative in all the things we try. And you know, if you have an intuition that you want to try something, I would just go for it, right? I mean, I, I've used uh, video. I videotaped people dancing in you know, ayahuasca ceremonies and then showed it to them later and they think, wow, I didn't, I didn't know that was happening. You know? <laughs> so with video, you can really show somebody what they were doing when they, and they, and then, then, they can, then they can try it in the waking state and say, oh yeah, now I remember. You know? So I think there's many tools we could, we could use like video and audio. And I know that some people have objections to this, but I always like to have a little digital recorder during ceremonies and something major is happening. I'm just gonna flip that thing on and just start talking. Because I know a lot of things I forget, 
I've, some of it is so amazing, but I, wanna, I, I don't want to forget. I would like to remember, but I'm sort of a, I, I am a scientist, so, I, so it's a, some people don't want to do that. They'd rather maybe do artwork in the morning. You know, in the morning, you want to do artwork, you know, and that's the, that's the way you would, you, they would, you would bring it back to yourself. I like the idea. Yeah. So I think we need to wrap up. Um, if you have any more questions, we'll be right out here celebrating at the bar. <laughs> and thank thank you, you for coming.